Okay, this is EME 3214 Mechatronics. We're going to talk about Bode plots as part of our frequency response. Now, recall that when you have a linear time invariant system, if I give it a sine wave input, I get a sine wave output. The output has the same frequency and the same waveform but it will be somewhat shifted in phase and changed in magnitude, and we'll talk about that in just one second. But given that phase and magnitude information, we can graph it as a function of frequency and come up with what are called Bode plots because they were developed by Bode at Bell Labs in 1930s, 1940s. So it's a very handy-dandy way of, of plotting this stuff. We have two parts, traditionally the magnitude plot on the top, plots the magnitude of input-output transfer function in decibels with respect to logarithmic frequency. So the magnitude of G, J omega in decibels is 20 times the log base 10 of the magnitude of that transfer function G of J omega versus the log base 10 of omega. So we end up with a plot. This is decibels, and this is log omega, or log of frequency, we end up with a plot that looks something like that. The other piece of the plot is the phase, and let me, let me just draw the picture here for a second. If this is my input signal, sinusoidal of some frequency, and I got the input to my system, which has a transfer function, G of S. The output is going to be something also sinusoidal at the same frequency. Yeah, I didn't draw that very good. But the, it, the output is going to have a different magnitude than the input. Okay, that's, that's this plot here where we plot the variations in magnitude as a function of frequency. And then there's this, this phase shift here where um, the output is delayed or in theory it could be even ahead of, but typically that's not the case. So we will plot the phase in degrees. against the log of omega, log of the frequency, and then we'll get a shape. Uh, in this case, we'll just assume it looks something like that. So with those two plots, we can tell a lot about the system. We can tell how it's going to behave. Uh, we can tell what range of frequencies it's, it's, it functions at. Uh, I mentioned this was developed by Bodie at Bell Labs. He's working on amplifiers in one really you know, key thing about his amplifier is, you know, what kind of frequency can you get up to and still get a good signal out of it? So he approached this from a frequency analysis perspective. So let's get into the fun stuff here. If I have an example here, um, to do this Bode diagram, there's two ways we can do this. One, we could just collect all the data experimentally where we put a sine wave in at some frequency, measure the response, put it on a graph, change the frequency, measure graph, measure graph, okay? But to calculate this, to generate this from a transfer function, we need to calculate the magnitude and phase of that transfer function as a function of frequency. So we'll take our transfer function. In this case, it has a single pole at minus one, and it has two poles, one at zero, one at minus, or single zero at minus one. I'm sorry, I said pole. And it has two poles, one's going to be at zero and the other's going to be at minus 10 for the denominator. And um, we substitute j omega for s, where j is the square root of minus one, and omega is our frequency, and we get a frequency-based transfer function j omega plus 1 over j omega times j omega plus 10. I did a little factoring there. Now, we want to find the magnitude of this. Um, 
at any point in time, if I were to plot, I can divide, if I divided this up, this whole transfer function result into the real and imaginary parts, I would, could plot it on a complex plane where this is real, this is imaginary. Um, I guess we're using J, not I. Okay. Um, and I have, I'll have the real part is this, the imaginary part is that, and I'll have some number here, and the magnitude or length of that is basically, you know, from Pythagorean theorem, it's the imaginary part squared plus the real part squared, take the square root of the whole thing. So we can do the same thing. Um, now, figuring out exactly the response here in the complex space is complex. There you go. But it's, it, we can simplify it a little bit. So we're going to, like I said, we're going to take the magnitude of the numerator divided by the magnitude of the denominator, and that will be equal to the square root of j omega squared plus 1 squared divided by omega j omega times the square root of, that's the quantity j omega squared, j omega squared plus 10 squared. And then we'll take from there, we'll, we'll take that magnitude, um, we'll take the log 20 times the log base 10 of the magnitude of g of j omega to convert it into decibels. And we'll use that in our plot. For the angle, um, I'm going to say that, um, the angle we can break down into the angle of the numerator minus the angle of the denominator. So it's the angle of j omega plus 1 minus the angle of j omega times j omega plus 10. The, numer the numerator minus the denominator. And our angle, in, if we went back to our, our plot here, we've got some some real part, some imaginary part. And our our angle here is going to be basically the inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. And then we'll, we can write that as the tangent minus 1 of Omega over one for the for the numerator, and for our denominator we will subtract um, tangent minus one of <coughs> excuse me the imaginary part j omega over ten and minus tangent minus one and maybe you see the problem coming here, but it's not really a problem. Omega and the the real part of that pole right here at at j omega, the or is of course zero. So now we're dividing by zero. Is that a problem? Well, how does the tangent behave when you get close to the vertical y-axis or the imaginary axis in our case? In this, in our case, uh, as 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 the angle approaches that axis, the tangent, which is essentially the sine over the cosine, goes to infinity because cosine goes to zero. And that's what we have here. So we can say that the limit as the um, cosine or denominator approaches zero of, of um, the inverse tangent omega over zero is basically going to be 90 degrees, okay? Because the tangent as as the angle approaches 90 degrees, the tangent of that angle approaches infinity. So yes, we have a divide by zero, but it's not it's not the end of the world for us, fortunately. So what we can do is we can take that transfer function and using those 
expressions we had before, we can plug it in and we can fill in this table. We can uh, give it an omega. We can calculate the magnitude. We can convert it to decibels. We can calculate the angle. And we can plot our, um, our plot here. Uh, um, how is, oh yeah, okay, never mind. So it'll look something like this for the magnitude, and the phase will look something like this. That's not the scale, but, but rather than spend a lot of time chugging numbers and plotting by hand, I'm going to take a sh uh, minor shortcut, go to MATLAB, and let me open up my MATLAB script file. Oops. Okay, oops, that's not the right one. That's, I want the script file. Where is it? It's that one. Okay, I have created the script file in MATLAB to do some lift, heavy lifting for us. First thing I do is calcul is assign some values of the frequency, omega, start at 0 0.01 and go up to 1,000 radians per second. Those correspond to the values in that um, in this table here. I actually have one additional on the top and one additional on the bottom. Uh, I can here. This is my transfer function: g of j omega equals j plus one divided by j omega divided by j plus. Oops, not twenty. It's actually ten, but I corrected that below. Um, so I can calculate the magnitude of my numerator from the equations I had before, and that's the square root of omega squared plus one. And I'll point out, for those of you still rusty on your MATLAB, I use the dot power, the dot caret, um, because I want to do element by element arithmetic. I want, you know, 0 0.01 squared 0.1 squared, 0.2 squared, 0.5 squared. I don't want to do a matrix squared where I would take the um, omega and omega transpose and do the matrix algebra. I don't want to do that, so I use the dot product or dot power. Uh, that gives me the magnitude of the numerator. Magnitude of the denominator is the same thing. I have omega. I have a dot times because I want to do it element by element. T dot times the square root of omega dot to the power of 2 plus 10 dot to the power 2. So that gives me an array of magnitudes. And for the denominator, I take the array of magnitudes for the numerator, divide by the array of magnitudes of the denominator using a dot divide again. And I get an array with the magnitude that corresponds to each of those omegas that I created above. Phase of the numerator, arc tangent a tan 2d of omega in one. Um, it's a tan is inverse tangent in MATLAB. I'm using a tan two rather than just the arc tangent because a tan two lets me give it two arguments. It gives me the numerator and the denominator separately. So when I get to that uh, that pole that sits there at zero, I can send it omega as a numerator and zero as a denominator, and I don't get my divide by error, divide by zero error. And also, MATLAB knows how to handle this situation. It says, okay, you're at uh, 90 degrees of phase because the cosine or the denominator is equal to zero. And the other thing it will do is a tan two is, if, for example, if I have, if I did the arc tangent of four over four, that gives me 45 degrees. Right? If I did the arc tangent of minus 4 over minus 4, well, the minuses cancel out and I get 45 degrees when really I want, you know, I wanted 180 plus 45. I want it in a different quadrant. A tan 2 lets me put in the signed uh, omega and 0 and put things in the appropriate quadrant as, in addition to handling that, those cases where um, the denominator is equal to 0. So I'm using A tan 2. And then the ATAN2D, the D format, the normal ATAN2 gives me the angle in radians. ATAN2D gives me the angle in degrees, okay, which is what I want for my body plot. So, after all that, 
I calculate the phase of the numerator. I calculate the phase of the denominator from the two parts. My total phase is the phase of the numerator minus the phase of the denominator. Okay. Um, I'm going to print some fancy stuff here on the MATLAB in the MATLAB command window so I can get a nice table. It looks just like the one on the on the um, the slide. I'll print the omega, the magnitude, the magnitude in decibels, and open this up a little bit, in a phase on, on nicely formatted. I will open up a figure called figure one. For those of you who don't recall all your MATLAB command stuff, I'm going to create, use the subplot command to create an array of axes. I'm going to create an array of axes that's two axes I by one axis wide, and I'm going to access the first axis in that array on this figure one. So I'm going to end up with essentially two plots, one on top, one on the bottom. And on the top one, the first axis in this two by one array of axes, plot. I'm going to do a semi log x, which is a semi log plot with x being logarithmic. My x value will be omega. My y value will be the, the magnitude in decibels. I'm going to make it a red line, a straight line with, with asterisks at each data point right there. Turn the grid on. I'm going to set the axes to values that match the Bode plot I generate later on. Then I go to the second plot in my two by one subplot array with that command. I plot semi-log x, omega, and the phase angle, turn on the grid, turn on the axes. And then, just to check my work, see if my, my hand math, is, or hand calculating, or hand programming, I guess I didn't really do the math. I'm going to use this transfer function command to create a linear time invariant system in MATLAB. And the transfer function command takes the numerator and the denominator. Remember, our numerator was j omega plus 1, or 1s plus 1. Our denominator was s squared plus 10s, not the 20 that I show here. So, plus 0. There's a constant of 0. So what I'll do is I'll give the command for the numerator, I'll give an array of numbers and each one goes to a decreasing power of s. Since there's two of them, this would be 1s plus 1. So the 1, 1 gives me 1s plus 1. In the denominator, I've got three elements. So it would be 1s squared, that first one, plus 10s plus 0 will give me my denominator. And since I left the semicolon off right there, it's going, at the end, it's going to, um, echo that to the screen so we can see what that looks like. And then I'll open up the sig second figure. We'll give it the command Bode in the name of the linear time invariant system, which we just called SIS. And then that'll generate that plot automatically. And the two should pretty much match. So let me run this. And I will go to MATLAB, just to our command window. And you can see here's my table that I filled out. Thank you. Um, this is the frequency starting at 0 0.01 radians per second, going up to 1,000 radians per second. My magnitude, the linear magnitude, starts out at 10. And then the next entry is at 1.5. And you can see it just keeps getting smaller, 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 smaller. As I, and actually, I ran out of, I should have printed an additional significant digit to, to even see that one. Converting that into decibels, 20 times the log base 10 of g j omega. I got 20 dB here at the low frequency. It goes to 0.43 there at 1, um, minus 5, minus 13, and it just rolls off to minus 60 dB, which is, you know, you can see at uh, 0 dB, if 0 dB is 1, 60 dB is less than 0 0.001, quite a bit less. So. 0.01 is 40 dB, so there's, it's gone by the time you get to there. And our phase starts out at approximately minus 90, 
it comes up to approximately minus 40, and then it goes back down to approximately minus 90. So let's look at that actual plot. This is the figure of the values that I just typed in by, you know, essentially did by hand. And this is the OD plot generated from that linear time invariant system. And you can see they basically match each other. You know, um, the, I made the axes the same scale. They're not perfectly identical. The Bode plot weaves together a little bit on the right. But you can, you can kind of go back and forth and see that we've got the same numbers in the same places. So we've got some confidence that we did this right, and we've got a legitimate method here, or at least our method matches MATLAB's method for calculating the magnitude and phase as a function of frequency. So let me go back to here. And okay, that's what it looks like. The number's in the wrong place. Um, we'll move on. So kind of recap that a little bit and be a little more generic. If I have some transfer function polynomial, uh, Polyno irrational function, polynomial, polynomial in the numerator, polynomial in the denominator, both as a function of s. That would be this here. I can factor that out into the steady state gain term and a series of zeros and a series of poles. Okay, that should be nothing new for you guys. Then I can say that the magnitude of my transfer function is the magnitude of that big fraction, and I can break that up into steady state gain, or the um, magnitude one over the, each pole. So these are all the poles in there. I can multiply together times the magnitude of all the zeros, like that, and that makes it a lot easier for me to calculate because I can, you know, this is a simple calculation, that's a simple calculation, and then I could multiply them together at this point or make it even simpler, less important now than it was back before computers, but still a useful thing. Um, I can, when I, when I take the log of each of these terms individually, log base 10 multiplied by 20 converted to decibels. So I take each of those in decibels. Well, since I'm dealing with logs, instead of multiplying, I add each element together. So my total gain in decibels is the sum of the gain from each pole in decibels added up plus the sum of the gains from each zero added up, okay, or one over the gain of the poles gain of one over the poles. That's the best way to say it. It's the gain of one over the poles. It's not really the gain of the poles, but it's one over. Okay? So I can just add those up. I can do it mathematically, and um, if I'm dealing with graphic elements and I'm graphing by hand, this, this, this is just super handy because I can literally just add on my graph, and with pencil and paper, I can add the effects of a number of poles and a number of zeros and get that whole picture, okay? So when we looked at the gain plot of the previous example, it had a slope like this, then it leveled out and it had a slope like this. That was a combination of a slope that went like this from that pole at zero, a term that went like this, for that zero, okay, so this zero plus this pole added together gives me this flat spot, and then my third pole came along and essentially went down like that, so I add add the three of those together at any point, since these two essentially cancel themselves out from here, it tracks that final pole down there. So I can graphically add this up and I can decompose it, recompose it, do what I need to do. The phase angle is not a lot different. The phase angle, um, I have, I have the phase of the whole transfer function. That's the same transfer function we saw before. 
with the um, numerator and the denominator. I can separate that out to the phase of the zeros all added together minus the phase of the poles. Okay? So again, I can calculate the effect of each pole and each zero, add them up, subtract them, and I get my result. So our phase plot before looked kind of like, like this, kind of. This, this was the phase, the phase of the, um, the zero at origin was minus 90 degrees everywhere. The phase of that, or not the zero, the pole at the origin, I'm sorry. The zero uh, at, at one kind of went like this. So you can see that um, went up like that. And at some point, we had the um, this second pole, which had a phase that goes like this. And you add those two together, and you get this kind of, well, the, it goes like this and level this and levels out. The zero levels out too. Um, so you get you add those up and you get the actual phase plot. Again, you can add them graphically by drawing them one at a time and add them together. So in this example, I would take this and I would factor it out into the poles and zeros. You can do this by hand. Um, you can do it in MATLAB. If you do it in MATLAB to find the roots of this polynomial, you want to remember that there's a zero on the end there for the constant part, so it doesn't get confused over how many powers of s you have. But um, so it's equal to three over two, our cc gain. I have s times s plus one, s plus three. That's my numerator divided by s plus two, s plus four, and s plus five. And that's my transfer function. I have zeros at zero, minus one, and minus three. I have poles at minus two, minus four, and minus five. And to do my magnitude, again, I just take the magnitude equals my, my DC gain, three or steady state gain, three halves. Uh, if I start with the numerator, I've got times the magnitude of J omega times the magnitude of J omega plus one times the magnitude of j omega plus 3 times, getting into the denominator, 1 over j omega plus 2 times 1 over j omega plus 4 times 1 over j omega plus 5. If I didn't want to do all that multiplication, I could convert to calculate each one of those independently, convert them to decibels, and then I could add them. My angle is the, remember our angle is the tangent minus one, the inverse tangent of the imaginary over the real. So I've got the angle equals tangent minus one of the imaginary part j omega over the real part zero, because that's there is no real in, in this one here. Um, and plus, these are the numerator terms, so it's plus tangent minus one of j omega over one plus tangent minus one of j omega over three, that's the numerator, minus inverse tangent of um, this term here, my imaginary part is j omega, my real part is two, minus tangent minus one of 
j omega over 4, and the last one minus tangent minus 1 of j omega over 5. So again, I can calculate each of those independently as a function of omega and add them up, and that gives me my phase and magnitude of the whole big mass. Let's let's kind of that's the, the idea behind it. Let's talk about some of the practical things. You saw me kind of faking some some pictures there and doing a really bad job of drawing. Let's talk about the rules of doing this. First order pole. If we have a first order transfer system with just one pole like this, uh, we have a steady state gain, which in this case is one, and we have a tau right there, where tau is greater than equal greater than zero, we have what we call a break frequency, omega b, equal to one over tau, and that's in radians per second, not hertz, not, you know, it's radians, you got to be careful. And we can use those two pieces that, really, this one piece of information, this break frequency, which is a function of tau, and do our magnitude plot. So if I do my dB here, and I'll put omega B here, um, my rule is I plot for my straight line approximation. I start at 0 dB. I go across to omega B, and then I roll off at minus 20 dB per decade. So 0 dB from DC to omega B, straight line, with the minus 20 dB slope after that. For the zeros, if I go back one more um, and erase my scribbling, we can see that the difference between the poles and the zero, instead of being um, essentially one over, I just have that uh, straight magnitude. So the zeros behave the same way, but they just go the other direction. When I plot the magnitude, I start out at zero, I hit omega b, and I have a, it's a b. I have a slope going up at 20 dB per decade. Okay? So they're just mirror images. For the phase plot, and I have to erase this because otherwise I don't have room, um, if this is our omega b, I'm going to draw 0.1 omega b and 10 omega b and minus 90 and 0 and 45 are key points. So from 0 to 0.1 omega b, I draw a straight line, horizontal line. Between 0.1 and 10, a straight line from 0 to minus 90 passing through our 45 point at omega b, like that, and then a straight line there, okay, at minus 90. So the phase of a single pole ends up being minus 90 degrees. Uh, it passes through 45 at omega b, which is a handy way to get our break point. And to draw the, the, the zero, it's the same thing. It's just the other direction because, again, we're adding versus subtracting. So what this tells me is that just by looking at these plots and knowing these simple rules, I can determine the relative order of the system. Here in a first-order system, I've got uh, 90 degrees of phase, and in my magnitude plot, I'm rolling off at, at 20 dB per decade. Those two things, either one or the other, tells me it's a first-order system. I know the break frequency from where it crosses 45 or from where that corner happens. I know the DC gain, the steady state gain, by the value of the gain at low frequencies there. So I can, given the, um, given the Bode diagram information, I can find out I can come up with everything I need to build a model of the system, or given a model of the system, I got everything I need to create the Bode diagram. So it goes both ways. Very handy. There is a better drawing.
of a first order pole, um, tau s plus one at our break frequency of one over tau. If I were to draw my straight line approximation, that would go there and this would go, put my hand in the wrong place. <laughs> this would go there, okay? And you can see it, there, it gets, the real life gets rounded off in the corner but this is my omega b here. The difference there happens to be the minus 3 dB, okay? Um, on the frequency side, we, my straight line approximation would go to that point, that point, and that point. And it would look like that, where this is one tenth tau, ten tau, okay? And these are the exact equations over here on the left. But you can see the straight line approximation really isn't isn't awful. Doesn't want to erase. Okay. So we can go back and forth from the graph to a, a model or from the model to a graph. The zero is exactly the same thing, only inverted. A pole at the origin uh, behaves a little bit differently, but what we can, what we know about the pole at the origin is that, for example, at um, omega equal one, this magnitude here becomes equals one over one. So I go through, which is zero dB. So I go through 0 dB at a frequency of 1. I go through that point, and because it's a single pole, it has that same slope of 20 dB per decade. And a pole at the origin has a constant phase angle of minus 90. Again, remember our graph. Um, as omega changes, we're going to move up the imaginary axis like that right, because there is no real part, the real part is zero, so that phase angle is always that 90 degrees, and because this is a, a, a we're subtracting it because it's a, um, a pole, so it's always a constant 90 degrees no matter what magnitude of omega is, so that just stays there at minus 90. A zero at the origin Oh, what a surprise. It's just the mirror image with respect to the zero dB and the zero phase. It goes through that zero dB, one radian per second, has a positive slope of 20 and a phase of plus 90. Second order poles get a little ickier, to use a technical term. Um, if this is my second order transfer function right here, um, denominator S squared plus two zeta omega n s, zeta is our damping ratio between zero one, omega n is our natural frequency plus omega n squared, and we have an omega n squared in the numerator to keep the steady state gain equal to one or zero dB. Here. We calculate our break frequency, instead of being one over tau, our break frequency is omega n, radians per second, okay? So that much is not much different. Let me draw this. This is the B. This is omega B, which is equal to omega n. To draw this, we'll draw from much like we did before. We'll start out at zero draw a straight line to omega b, and then we'll roll off a straight line, but the difference is we have a slope here of 40 dB per decade because it's a second order system. There's two poles. Each pole rolls off at 20 dB. Um, and also there is, a, there is a peak value here where right around this break point near the natural frequency, it's, it's going to it's going to resonate a bit and we'll get a peak there. And the, the peak value, omega 
r, this resonant value, is going to be just a little bit to the left of omega n, okay? So omega n is over here and the peak is there. And the magnitude is um, given by this expression here. And you can see both of these are a function of the damping ratio. As the damping ratio gets larger, the magnitude of that peak falls down and um, and also the location of that peak moves away from the um, natural frequency. Phase. Phase gets even messier too. Um, draw it down here. I guess I didn't need to erase that other one. My phase, if I, this is my omega b, I have a point here which is one-fifth zeta omega n. So it's not with the single pole, it's just one-tenth of omega n. Here it's one-fifth zeta omega n. And our other point here is five zeta omega n, one-fifth zeta omega n, and omega b is equal to omega n. And because I have two poles, I start at zero. I go all the way to minus 180 and I pass through 90. And if I drew this respectably, my straight line, I started at zero between zero and one-fifth zeta omega n. I got a straight line between the one-fifth and five omega zeta omega n. I have a straight line getting me down to 180, down to here, and it's going to pass through that 90 degree point right there and then I get flat. So what you can see here is that as um, zeta is less than one, remember, and as zeta gets smaller, that one-fifth zeta omega n is going to start crowding in, and this phase angle gets steeper and steeper at the same time that this peak in the magnitude plot gets bigger and bigger. So the peak and that phase angle change are, are both strong measures of zeta. And I can use information about the peak or information about the slope of zeta as a, a slope of the phase as it passes through 90 to, to calculate zeta. Um, the second order complex zeros are really just that mirror image about the zero dB and zero phase lines from the poles. I'm not going to draw them because I think the next slide, no, a couple of slides, we'll show you an example. So, so our, uh, if we take a closer look here, hang on, let me get my pages back in order here. Uh, okay, right there. Um, there it is. Okay, so I have my transfer function. Nothing new there. Uh, I can convert that into a frequency response function by substituting J omega for S. Okay, I can take this and I can factor the denominator here into a imaginary part and a real part, okay? And then to calculate the magnitude, I can um, take the, since these are the poles, I take one, one over the square root of the imaginary part squared plus the real part squared. And for the angle, the phase angle, I have the inverse tangent, negative inverse tangent of the, um, it's negative because it's a pull, of the imaginary part over the real part. And I can calculate those at every value of omega, just like we calculated before. And for any fixed value of omega, say I'm interested in my peak resonant frequency, um, well, I can calculate, find the maximum value of this function here, right? That will be the peak, and it comes out to be my omega r, solving 
for that peak is omega n times the square root of minus 2 zeta squared. And that actual magnitude, if I substitute this term in here for omega up in this equation, gives me a magnitude for that peak equal to that amount right there. So you can see they're both a function of that damping ratio. And the more, the bigger the damping ratio, the less peak I have and um, the bigger the damping ratio, the, um, you know, it, it moves towards omega n. So, and there's a better picture than what I drew. You, omega n happens right here at that 90 degree crossing point. Omega n in this plot is right there. Omega r is right there which is the peak, and this is omega n. You can see they're slightly different. Um, everything else is the same equations we saw there, and we just would have to plug the values in. We could use MATLAB if we wanted to work this out. We could do a number of different things. Obviously, if I just took the transfer function like this, I could put that directly in MATLAB. If I wanted to calculate values at specific frequencies, I can use the equations like this. The complex zero, it's the same thing, just inverted because it's minus instead of plus. I'm not going to spend time. Time is valuable. Um, and here's just showing the mirror image, the, the zero or the pole going like this and the zero going like that. And they are indeed mirror images of each other over the zero dB gain and the zero degree phase. And this is a better picture showing the effect of different frequency response. As I go this way, I'm increasing zeta. And increasing zeta sends me this way on the slope. Okay? So you can kind of see, I don't know the exact numbers that this was calculated at, but you can see the effect of changing zeta as we go. Last slide, we're almost done. Um, just a few odds and end things. We have the natural frequency, okay? Um, when we looked at the step response of these systems, you recall second order system, they would resonate at some frequency. That was our damped natural frequency, omega d, which is omega n times the square root of one minus zeta squared. And just a slide or two ago, we talked about the resonant or peak frequency, omega r, which we said was omega n times 1 minus 2 zeta squared. So that tells us that if we have omega, um, well, I'm going to draw a peak here in my Bowie diagram. So we have omega n here. Omega d is somewhere there, and omega r is right at that peak. So they're kind of lined up in order, and depending upon the value of zeta, they move closer together, get further apart. One thing to be clear about, um, it's easy to think of that peak as ha causing overshoot and things like that. That's not quite the case. Um, when the damping ratio is 0 0.707, there's no peak in the Bode plot. So uh, at 0 0.707, my magnitude kind of rolls off and goes like that. There's no peak. But that doesn't mean that in the time domain, the step response, there's no overshoot. You know, at point, approximately 0 0.707 or less than, yeah, greater than 0 0.707, um, I can still get an overshoot in my time response. But I, you know, but I won't get a lot of resonating. So don't, don't get peak versus not peak confused with overdamped and underdamped systems. When I get, you know, greater than, um, okay. So when zeta is less than one, the system is underdamped. As long as it's less than one, we get some overshoot. When the system is greater than one, there's no overshoot, and I just get a response like that. Of course, when zeta is greater than one. It means I have two real poles. I don't have that complex conjugate pair. Okay? 
And then when zeta gets less than 0.707, I start to see the peak in in the Bode plot. So if I go 0 0.7071, here I have, well, in this range I have a peak. And in this range here, I have overshoot. Okay? So they don't quite line up there. And as we pointed out, as zeta approaches zero, omega r approaches omega n, the peak, the magnitude, the max value of that magnitude increases, and also the phase transition from zero to minus 180 becomes sharper. And next up will be a video discussing the, um, um, we'll do some examples of these using real numbers, and I hope this is helpful. See you in class.